As you may have guessed from the title, this video will be about various unique, obscure and forgotten racing cars in various racing games across all genres. But before we begin, we need to select some virtual cars to cover of course. And as luck would have it, today's sponsor can supply plenty. That's because it's Asphalt 9 Legends. This sponsorship came at the perfect time because the car list in Asphalt 9 Legends is filled with pretty much the exact type of car for this video. Of course we have stuff like the Lancer Evo, Dodge Viper and plenty of Ferraris, but also homologation specials like the dominant CLK GTR and BOP inducing MC12. We have 90s hypercars with Lamar heritage like the Tom Walkinshaw created Jaguar XJR15 and XJ220S and it even has the Glickenhaus and Peugeot hypercars that race around the World Endurance Championship today. A9 Legends really is keeping the wacky arcade racing genre alive as you can drive, drift, jump and fly these and several other motorsport unicorns in quick adrenaline filled races on PC, Xbox, Nintendo Switch, Steam Deck, iOS and Android devices. Meaning you can play everywhere, literally. Next time you're stuck in limbo watching another endless IMSA full course caution, why not treat yourself to a quick game of A9 Legends? Just make sure you're in the grandstands and not in a car. Race not starting due to weather delay? Do what Race Control did in 1991 at Autopolis during the 8th round of the World Sports Car Championship. Play some video games. But maybe not whatever this guy is playing. There we go. That's better. Looks a lot better too, because this mobile game looks graphically pretty amazing. You can even drive a period correct Group C car in the form of the Jaguar XJR9. And best of all, you can start playing the game for the low price of $0, because it's free. You can download the game right now by scanning the QR code or following the link down in the description. Even as far back as the original and humble Asphalt Urban GT, a launch title for the original Nintendo DS, the series has always featured a handful of unique racing cars, like the unique pair of British icons who took on the 24 hours of Le Mans in the early 2000s, the Raceport Salisbury run TVR T400R and Morgan Aero 8. Both of these cars feature in a few other games, most notably in the GTR series, but they both made their debut in the handheld title, and they were both more competitive in the virtual world than they ever were at Le Mans. First, in 2002, there was the Morgan. To celebrate the anniversary of Morgan's class win back in 1962, Morgan decided to go back to Le Mans with the Aero 8. This wasn't actually a new car, as it was based on the even more obscure bright blue Morgan Plus A chassis from 1997, a car that even then was hopelessly outdated compared to its rivals. At Le Mans, the then quote-unquote new car was usually found at the tail end of the LMGT class. In 1962, Morgan achieved its class win with a little 2-liter 4-cylinder, but for this edition, they had a BMW 4-liter V8 powering their race car, an engine that only lasted for 18 of the required 24 hours. At least they weren't alone in their misfortune, as almost half the grid that year retired. The next year, the team that ran the Morgan, Raceport Salisbury, was back. Only this time they were running a TVR T400R. This car can be seen as an offspring of the wild V12 Speed 12, but even though it features half the cylinders, it doesn't mean it's half as wild. The naturally aspirated 4 liter Speed 6 six cylinder engine was good for at least 400 horsepower. There were ambitious plans to make several road going versions of it, but only a handful were ever made. That's including the prototypes. While the TVR proved to be quite competitive and successful in its native British GT championship, at Le Mans it was always handled by mechanical gremlins. None of the two cars entered in the 2003 race made it to the line, one due to mechanical issues and the other due to being sent to the Shadow Realm by an overly ambitious prototype. The following year two TVRs would finish respectively 8th and 9th in class. In 2006 yet another small GT class team using a car built in limited numbers would race at Le Mans. It was Team LNT and their Panos Esperante GT LN. Everybody probably used the diesel Audi R10 TDI to win Le Mans in race driver grid, but everybody also probably used the panels at some point to get their first taste of Le Mans. Just like in the game, in real life the panels also got overshadowed by the attention the Audi got. It was after all the first successful diesel prototype. And even though the cars couldn't be more further apart, one is a state of the art high tech futuristic prototype, while the other is a bare bones GT car using Ford modular V8s, they both share some unique victories. While many people doubted the Audi could be competitive because it was so experimental when it made its debut at Sebring in 2006, even more people doubted the anything but experimental panels from being competitive as well, as it would be up against GT Racing Royalties Ferrari and Porsche. Oh, and that other race car made popular by a racing game, the M3 GTR. 
But just like Audi, who proved all the haters wrong by winning on their debut, so did the Panos, as the humble, no-nonsense Ford V8 powered number 50 Esperante crossed the line P1 in class after 12 hours of hard racing, beating the far more exotic European material in the process. The team that achieved this win was Multimatic Motorsport, the same guys who now built the Porsche 963 hypercar. And Sebastian Bourdais was behind the wheel as well, so they were bound to get a good result. Perhaps the smaller team LNT also didn't expect to be successful at Le Mans that year, but in a flurry of deja vu, the Audi won again, making history being the first diesel car to win at Le Mans, and the humble little Panos beat the international all-star competition of Porsche and Ferrari again by winning Le Mans in class 2. Stuck in the shadow of its bigger brother, the Aspirante GTR1, the GT2 version really deserves more praise thanks to these achievements, whether it be in the real world or the virtual one. From a successful car to a rather less successful one, and a whole lot more obscure too, the Seat Cupra GT, found in only a handful of games like the early Forza titles and the GTR Evolution expansion pack for Race 07, the Seat Cupra GT is a bit of a weird one, mainly because the FIA didn't allow it to race. The Cupra GT was a race car with no road car version, there never was a homologation version, meaning that it was exempt from any major international FIA series. It had to make do with its native Spanish GT Championship and the less tight, more run what you brung style International GT Open Championship. You'd think not being able to race in the big leagues meant that it didn't have to face stiff opposition. But the opposite is true. National racing series are the playground of older gen race cars, but that doesn't mean they're obsolete. It had to compete against stuff like the Marcos, Moslers, dozens of Ferraris and Porsches, the ever-dominant Vipers and GT1 machinery like the Aston Martin DBR9. Seat was way out of its league. Up to this point they were used to building rally cars. A high-speed circuit racer was maybe a step too far. Nevertheless, a handful of teams tried their best with limited results. A lack of power from the Audi V6 compared to the established competition and a terrible lack of reliability were the main limiting factors. One team who ran the car even took matters into their own hands by removing the overboosted V6 and swapping in a Lamborghini Gallardo sourced V10 instead. But the small increase in horsepower was balanced out by the increase in weight, so not a whole lot of performance was gained. Safe to say, Seat's career in touring car racing was a lot more impressive compared to their efforts in the GT scene. Speaking of a new brand entering a GT racing scene, that brings us nicely to the last car of this video, and it's the most mysterious one of them all, the Lexus ISF racing concept found in Gran Turismo 5 and 6. First revealed at the 2008 Tokyo Auto Salon, the concept car raised some major eyebrows, especially that of the Germans. The road car ISF had just a year prior all but declared war on the major three German super saloons the BMW M3, Mercedes C63 AMG and Audi RS4, the latter of which competed in the extremely popular Deutsche Touringwagen Masters, better known as DTM. And here they saw a menacing black ISF that looked suspiciously like a ready-to-race DTM car. Almost immediately everyone rejoiced, as after Opel left the series in 2005, it looked like DTM was gonna have a third manufacturer again. After the Opel exit, the series didn't push through any major regulation changes in hopes of attracting new brands, and it looked like Lexus had taken the bait, and it would have made perfect sense. Making their flagship performance car take on the Germans at their own game seemed like an amazing marketing opportunity. But the Toyota representative was quick to lower expectations by stating the option to race in Europe was left open, but never explicitly stating they'd enter DTM. Further comments later made by Lexus ended the hype train altogether as they said it was just a test and development vehicle. They claimed it was a way to let the road car ISF engineers experience true driving pleasure and use whatever skill and knowledge they gained on track in the development of future performance models. We never got any exact specs of the car and despite it looking like a DTM car, Lexus was adamant to say it just wasn't. So what exactly was this thing? Simple, it is a DTM car, but not the one you were expecting. Lexus and Toyota may have put a nice PR spin on the car's story, but the fact they never released any specifications of it was because of one very good reason, and it's a bit of an embarrassing one. This car is an Opel. Specifically, it's a 2005 spec Opel Vectra GTS V8 in a fancy dress. This raises the question if Lexus, or rather parent company Toyota, was indeed at some point evaluating a possible entry into DTM. After all, the car was spotted at Paul Ricard with Marc Duez behind the wheel. And last time I checked, he wasn't a Lexus engineer. 
Back in the game you can even find a bit of proof of it being a real DTM car as the model features a fully rendered model of the spec Bosch Motronic DTM ACU in the passenger footwell. Whatever the real reason of this car existence may be, it wasn't enough to convince Lexus or Toyota to actually enter DTM. There was a massive economic crisis at the time and Toyota was about to pull the plug on their F1 program. Perhaps this just wasn't the right time to commit to an entire new motorsport adventure. And that's it for today's video. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on the next one. And do remember to check out today's sponsor Asphalt 9 Legends through the link in the description or by following the QR code. Some cars can't or won't ever turn the wheel in anger on a racetrack again. But luckily, through games like A9 Legends, their legacy can live on.